Good evening. Uh, this is M.T. Clark, and this is Bonhoeffer's Discipleship. Uh, it's an informal walkthrough um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, uh, the, uh, the, co <laughs> the Cost of Discipleship. Uh, who am I? I'm M.T. Clark of the M.T. for Christ 24-7 podcast and YouTube channel, and I also uh, do semi-daily um, entries and encouragements on the path of Christian discipleship on mtforchrist.org. And uh, I have a, a heart for discipleship. I, I lead a uh, men's discipleship group uh, for Freedom in Christ Ministries and uh, the Freedom in Christ course. And um, I love, I love Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And um, basically uh, I felt moved to do this to to share his work and to talk about discipleship. Um, so we hope you enjoy it. Um, we are, we basically go through a PowerPoint and, and go through Bonhoeffer's words. So let's begin as we share our screen. Okay. And let's go to the presentation view. And here we go. And away we go. And it's Diedrich Bonhoeffer's Discipleship. We are on Lesson 7. Uh, tonight we're going to cover these chapters in uh, Bonhoeffer's books uh, that uh, are entitled The Righteousness of Christ, uh, Brother or Kindred, depending on your version, and Woman, uh, or I forget what the alternate one was. But here we go. <laughs> um, it's brought to you. <laughs> it's brought to you by me, M.T. Clark, and my mtforchrist.org uh, blog and the MT for Christ 24-7 podcast uh, available on all major podcast um, <laughs> platforms. It's an audio podcast, so enjoy. Um, a reminder about our, stu our study is that it's on discipleship, not the disciple. It's uh, and we present Bonhoeffer's words. Uh, we don't go into much uh, detail about Bonhoeffer other than his commentary. Uh, it's not about the man. However, if you're interested in the life of D Diedrich Bonhoeffer, it's certainly worth uh, worth checking out. And we recommend Eric Metaxas' books, uh, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, and Spy. And we also recommend his latest uh, book, Letter to the American Church, that draws parallels between uh, Bonhoeffer's time in Nazi Germany and uh, our culture today in America with the cancel culture. Um, the, tonight we are we are also uh, hyping uh, Dr. Neil Anderson's "Victory Over the Darkness" as somebody as a, uh, a community freedom ministry associate for Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm a big fan of his work as I've been transformed um, partially uh, due to the Freedom of Christ material. And um, so we, we recommend that. And it just so happens that uh, if you if you would like, we uh, uh, on our podcast, uh, we have a, a discipleship class based on Victory Over the Darkness called Victory Over the Darkness. And there's a, a YouTube um, playlist uh, of that class as well from uh, when I when I did it it is an audio um, uh, an audio teaching of course uh, as I podcasted those uh, those classes back in 2021 and I still haven't transitioned uh, to video on everything um, for obvious reasons <laughs> anyway uh, we move on um, <clears throat> This is uh, based on Diedrich Bonhoeffer's book, Discipleship. It's also known as uh, The Cost of Discipleship. And uh, because it was in German, there's actually more than one version of the text. Um, uh, tonight, we will be drawing from Diedrich Bonhoeffer's works, Volume 4, Discipleship, Um, um but I am a huge fan of the, uh, the what I what I thought was the original uh, cost of discipleship um, that was published in 1959 and, and 1995 was the paperback version I have. Um, but so if you're if you're a big fan and notice differences in the text, it's because we're going to be doing um, uh, we're we're presenting the uh, material from uh, the Diedrich Bonhoeffer's works volume four, not the original. Um, 
they don't differ much, but sometimes it can be quite stark, like reading the NKJV versus the NLT in the Bible. It's a little different. Um, the source of tonight's uh, teachings are right from the Bible, the truth. And today's Bible study with Dietrich Bonhoeffer is uh, going to cover Matthew 5, 17 through 32. And we begin uh, with the righteousness of Christ. Matthew 5, 17 through 20 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And uh, here we uh, have a, a nice photo telling us that Jesus came to fulfill the law. And obviously Matthew 5.17 is drawn from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's the words of Christ. And uh, so we move on with Bonhoeffer's commentary. Um, and did you think Christ would destroy the law? Um, Bonhoeffer writes, it is not surprising that the disciples supposed that the end of the law was coming with such promises they received from their law, Lord, in which everything was devalued, which had value in the eyes of the people, and everything was called blessed, which had no value. They were indeed addressed and set apart as people to whom simply everything had been given by God's free grace. As the certain heirs of the kingdom of heaven, as those who now possessed everything, they had full and personal communion with Christ, and who made everything new. They were the salt, the light, the city on the hill. You know, they were the blessed ones from the Beatitudes. You know, he's talking to his disciples. Um, Bonhoeffer continues, thus everything old had passed away and been replaced. It was too easy to assume that Jesus would draw a line of final separation between himself and that and what went before, that he would declare the law of the old covenant to be repealed and declare his independence from it and his freedom as the son, that he would abolish it for his community. Yeah, it's the New Testament, right? So he'll just toss out the Old Testament. Um, well, <laughs> another discipleship pa paradox. We're unhindered but bound by the law. As, as disciples of Christ, that's how we go. Um, you know, <laughs> we have freedom, but, you know, not everything is good for us. Uh, Bonhoeffer writes, after everything that had been said before, the disciples could easily think, like Marcion, uh, who, co who, complaining of Judaizing uh, forgery, undertook the following text revision. Do not, do you think I came to fulfill the law or the prophets? I came to abolish them and, and not to fulfill them. Countless others since Marcion have re read and interpreted Jesus' words in that way. But Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Christ puts the law of the old covenant, covenant into force. How are we to understand that? We know that the disciples are addressed. Uh, uh, they who are bound to Christ alone. No law has allowed to hinder the, the communion between Jesus and the disciples. And that became clear in the commentary on Luke 9, 57, which says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that some said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And, um, you know, the one, one, one example, uh, you know, again and again, uh, when Christ was, um, on the earth and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God and repentance and faith in him. Um, you know, he, he really contested the old Testament law. The, the most stark examples of that are in the, um, in the instances where um, he did things on the Sabbath. Um, you know, he wasn't supposed to do that. You weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, but Christ, you know, was setting himself apart and, um, Discipleship is the allegiance to Jesus alone, and it is unmediated. Nevertheless, not, 
now an entirely unexpected step follows. The disciples are bound to the Old Testament law. Another example uh, that I can think of off the top of my head that where the law didn't get in the way of Christ and his disciples was Christ's commandment to go and take a, a, a donkey, uh, you know, basically for the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we know as Palm Sunday. Um, he just said to go and take it. And, you know, in some circles that would be considered theft. theft. And now granted, um, he said, if anyone should stop you, uh, just say the Lord has need of it. And, um, you know, we don't get a lot of commentary on what exactly happened, but we know uh, those, those um, Christ rode in on a donkey uh, to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. And we move along. So, not, you know, even the law doesn't get in the way between us and Jesus and following him necessarily. But, haha, hang on, we have to, we are bound to the Old Testament law. And uh, thus, in doing so, Jesus says two things to his disciples. One, allegiance to the law by itself is not yet discipleship nor may allegiance to this person of Jesus Christ without the law be called discipleship. Uh, he refers those to whom he had just given his full promise and complete communion back to the law. Um, because if it is he whom the disciples are following who does it, the law remains binding for them. The question must then arise, what is valid, Christ or the law? To which do we owe allegiance, to him alone or back to the law? Uh, Christ had said that no law must come between him and his disciples. Now, he says that abolishing the law would mean separation from him. You know, what does that mean? Uh, the old law, a new law, or a better righteousness? Uh, the law is the law of the old covenant, not a new law. So there you go. But the old, the one old law to which the rich young man and the tempting scribe, who were referred to, uh, referred as as the reveal, you know, were referred to as the revealed will of God, the old law, you know, Old Testament law is the will of God. It becomes a new commandment only because Christ binds his disciples to the law. His concern is not for a better law that, than that of the Pharisees. It is one and the same. It is the law which must remain and be carried out in every letter until the end of the world, which must be fulfilled to the letter. You know, um, His concern really is for a better righteousness. Those who do not have this better righteousness will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This will be because they have this dispense themselves from following Jesus who referred them back to the law but no one is able to achieve the better righteousness except those addressed here the disciples those called by Christ Christ's call Christ himself is required for that better righteousness um yeah I, I hate to go ahead but yeah basically our righteousness the better righteousness the, the righteousness better than the Pharisees is the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, his imputed righteousness. Um, and uh, so we, we, we move along. Thus, it makes sense that at this point in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ speaks of himself for the first time. He himself stands between better righteousness and the disciples, from whom he demands that better righteousness. He has come to fulfill the law of the Old Testament. That is the presupposition of everything else. Jesus shows his complete unity with God's will in the Old Testament, in the law and the prophets. Indeed, he has nothing to add to the commandments of God. He keeps them. Uh, that is the only thing he adds. He fulfills the law. That is what he says about himself. Therefore, it is true. He fulfills it to the last letter. By his fulfilling it, everything is done, which is needed for the fulfillment of the law. Jesus will do what the law requires. He wants to obey the Father. Therefore, he will have to suffer death. For he alone understands the law as God's law. That means that the law itself is not God, nor is God the law as if the law had replaced God. You know, <laughs> nice try, but you're both wrong. Um, that is how Israel misunderstood the law. 
you know, if they idolize the law and legalizing God, uh, were Israel sins, uh, in, inverted removing divinity from the law and separating God from God's law would be the sinful misunderstanding of the disciples. Um, in both cases, God and the law would be separated from each other or indeed, or identified with each other, which is basically the same thing. When the Jews equated God and the law, they did it in order to get God into their power with the law. God was dissolved into the law and was no longer Lord over the law. Um, now, the disciples, if, if the disciples supposed they might separate God from the law, just follow Jesus, they did it in order to get God into their power and the salvation they possessed. We don't have to follow the law, we're saved. Um, both times the gift and the giver were switched God and the law, you know, um, God became the law became God. And because we have God, we don't have to follow the law. They, they got switched. God was denied either way, uh, by the way of the law or by the way of the promise of salvation. You know, so there's that. And Against both misunderstandings, Jesus validates an, anew the law as God's law. God is the giver of the law, uh, is the giver and the Lord of the law, and is fulfilled only in personal communion with God. This is the key. Um, there is no fulfillment of the law without communion with God. There is no, also no communion without God without fulfillment of the law. The first refers to the Jews. The second refers to the misunderstanding that threatened the disciples. Jesus, the Son of God, who alone stands in full communion with God, renews the validity of the law by coming to fulfill the law of the Old Covenant. Because he was the only one who did that, he alone could truly teach the law and how it is fulfilled. The disciples would know and understand that when he told it to them, because they knew who he was. The Jews could not understand it as long as they did not believe him. That was why they had to reject his teaching of the law as blasphemy against God, or rather, against God's law. Thus, for the sake of God's true law, Jesus had to suffer at the hands of the advocates of the false law. Jesus died on the cross as a blasphemer, as a transgressor of the law, because he put into force the true law against the misunderstood law, the fulfilled law. And I have a text, but we're going to not look at that. And um, that's that's the communion. <laughs> you know, the, Jesus had perfect communion with the Father. He knew that the, the law was valid, and he knew it was God's law, and he knew that even him uh, in the person of a, of a man could fulfill it because his heart was in communion with the father. And, you know, he only wanted to do the father's will. And the, the scriptures tell us, and thus that communion is what makes it possible to over, to overcome the law, to fulfill the law. And that's what Christ did. And by us being communion with Christ, we can overcome sin and death. Uh, death, we're saved. Sin, we can say no to sin uh, after we come to faith in Christ like we never were able to before because we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in us. It's through the communion and through faith alone that we can be sanctified. Um, there will be choices to make and everything else, but we have to have faith that we have been changed, that we are new creations in Christ, and that that old sin is not who I am anymore. And if we believe it, we can act in fulfillment of the law by obeying it. Um, so just a little explanation from MT. Um, let's move along. Let's see. The crucified one is the perfect fulfillment. You know, the fulfillment of the law about which Jesus spoke could therefore come about only through his being nailed on the cross as a sinner. He himself is the crucified one, is the perfect fulfillment of the law. Uh, this means that Jesus Christ and only he fulfills the law because he alone lives in perfect communion with God. He himself steps between his disciples. <laughs> Okay, we'll silence it again.
or for good. Anyway, uh, my apologies. Um, this, this means that Jesus Christ and only he fulfills the law because he alone lives in perfect communion with God. He himself steps between his disciples and the law, thus the imputed righteousness. Uh, but the law does not come between him and his disciples. The, the disciples' path to the law leads through the cross of Christ. Because Jesus points the disciples to the law, which he alone fulfills, he thus binds them anew to himself. He had to reject lawless allegiance apart from God's law because this would be enthusiasm and therefore would mean a disrupt, rupture of all bonds instead of being bound to him. The disciples' anxiety, however, that being bound to the law might separate them from Jesus was dispelled. Such anxiety could only arise from misunderstanding the law, which did, in fact, cut the Jews off from God. Uh, instead of this, it became clear the true adherence of Jesus is granted only together with adherence to God's law. And that, yeah, if you're going to be in perfect communion with the Lord, um, you know, true adherence to Jesus is granted only together with adherence to God's law. You, know, you how can you be in communion with Jesus if you disagree with the law? Um, you can't. He is the Word of God, right? Um, do and teach. <laughs> but if Jesus stands between his disciples and the law, it is not to release them from fulfilling the law. You're not free to do whatever you want. Instead, it is to enforce his demand that the law be fulfilled. The disciples' adherence to him requires the same obedience of them. Uh, also, fulfilling the law to the iota does not cancel that iota for the disciples from then on. It is fulfilled, that is all. But that fulfillment is precisely what really makes the law valid, so that now anyone who does and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do and teach. It would be possible to think of a teacher of the law, which it would be possible to think of a teaching of the law, which dispenses with doing it by explaining that the purpose of the law would be merely to let us know that its fulfillment is impossible. Such a teaching cannot claim to be based on Jesus. Yeah, you can't teach the law and say it's impossible to keep it. Christ did. Um, so we don't rest in our sin. You know, Christ doesn't say and tell the woman caught in adultery to sin no more because it's impossible. Um, you know, <laughs> so the law demands to be done, to be doers of the word, not hearers only, just as surely as he himself did it. Those who in discipleship follow Jesus, who fulfilled the law, do and teach the law in their following. Only those who do the law can remain in the community with Christ. Um, as we taught, you know, from a previous lesson that, you know, those who believe obey and those who obey believe, you know, um, it's synonymous there. We're not just believers, um, you know, with niceties and things. Um, we, we are followers of Christ. Um, we, we, we attempt to uh, fulfill the law ourselves. Now, granted there's grace because uh, we're not going to fulfill it perfectly. And um, Christ understands that, but uh, to be a true follower of Christ, we are to follow him. So that would be attempt to walk in his ways and turn from sin and repent of it and be held accountable and be responsible. Um, so not that I'm preaching legalism, but, you know, <laughs> Christ wants you to follow the law and follow him um, in love. So anyway, enjoy uh, the righteousness of the Pharisees. It is not the law which distinguishes the disciples from the Jews. Instead, it is the better righteousness. The righteousness of the disciples towers over the scribes. It surpasses them. It's something extraordinary and distinctive. This is the first time that the concept of, I won't even try to, uh, you know, um, <laughs> uh, the extraordinary, I believe, appears, which will assume so much importance in verse 47. We must ask, what did the righteousness of the Pharisees consist of? What does the righteousness of the disciples consist of? Um, uh, the Pharisees certainly never succumbed to the anti-scriptural fallacy of believing that the law should should be taught but not done. You know, 
The Pharisees intended to be doers of the law. The righteousness consisted of their immediate, literal obedience to what was commanded in the law. Their righteousness was their action. The goal of their righteousness was complete conformity of their action to what was commanded in the law. Nonetheless, a remnant always remained which had to be covered by forgiveness. Their righteousness always remained incomplete. The righteousness of the disciples could also consist solely of their doing the law. No one who did not keep the law could be called righteous. But the disciples' action surpasses that of the Pharisees in that it really is perfect righteousness as opposed to the imperfect righteousness of the Pharisees. How can this be? Um, what's the right answer to almost every question? Boom. The superiority of the disciples' righteousness is that Jesus stands between them and the law. That's the difference between the disciples' righteousness and the Pharisees. Jesus. He who completely fulfilled the law and in whose community they live. Uh, instead of a law not yet fulfilled, the disciples confronted a law which had already been fulfilled. Before they even began to obey the law, it was already fulfilled. Its demands were already satisfied. The righteousness required by the law is already there. It is the righteousness of Jesus who went to the cross for the sake of the law. Uh, how about that? He wanted to obey the law so much that he realized that he would be the atonement um, you know, for all of us sinful men, whoever put faith in him, um, you know, we would be saved. But because that righteousness is not only a good deed to be performed, but complete, true, and personal communion with God, I love that, complete, true, and personal communion with God, Jesus not only has righteousness, he is righteousness personified. He is the disciples' righteousness. That's why it's by Christ alone. You know, we can't fulfill the law perfectly by ourselves, but in communion with Jesus, we we do. Uh, it's imputed to us his righteousness, um, and we can we can make progress in how we walk. We can be sanctified. And calling his disciples, Jesus granted them participation in Himself. He gave them community with Him. He let them participate in his own righteousness. He granted them his own righteousness, his imputed righteousness. Uh, the disciples' righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. Jesus begins his talk about that righteousness by referring to his, his fulfillment of the law in order to make this point. The righteousness of Christ is really also the disciples' righteousness. In a strict sense, it remains righteousness freely granted, granted through the call to discipleship. It is that righteousness which consists precisely in following him. You know, that's why we can have, you know, not feel guilty because we've been called and when we follow Christ and put our faith in him, we're forgiven and we can overcome. And, and and we we walk in righteousness, not anything that we have, but because of our communion with Christ. The righteousness which received the promise of heaven in the Beatitudes. Blessed are all you guys. And, um, you know, you will inherit the earth and but yours is the kingdom of heaven. The disciples' righteousness is righteousness under the cross. It is the righteousness of the poor, the mournful, the hungry, the meek, and the peacemakers, and the persecuted for the sake of the call of Jesus. It is the visible righteousness of those who, in following him, become the light of the world and the city on the hill for the sake of the call of Jesus. The disciples' righteousness is better than that of the Pharisees in that it rests solely on the call into the community of Jesus, who alone has fulfilled the law. The disciples' righteousness really is righteousness because they themselves now truly do the will of God and fulfill the law. They The will of God is to follow Christ. Um, there you go. They fulfill the law. They follow him. The righteousness of Christ should not just be taught, but done. Otherwise, it is no better than the law, which is merely taught, but not obeyed. Everything which will be said next should be understood in the light of doing this doing of the righteousness of Christ by the disciples. In a word, this means to follow him. 
It is genuine, simple obedience and faith in the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is the new law, the law of Christ. You know, so, yeah, you know, if you want to, you know, I, I, one of my desires when I first became a Christian was to be an authentic Christian uh, as somebody who walked away from the church at an early age and uh, gotten all kinds of foolishness for most of my life. Um, when I got that call uh, to the Lord to come to him and put my faith in him, I wanted to be an authentic Christian. I wanted to not be a phony. Um, you know, I wanted to um, be, know what I was, what, what I was doing. I wanted to know it was all true. And so I read the word of God and I started to repent of, of all my sins and um, to practice who I was supposed to be in Christ. And it's through that, that, that answer to the call of discipleship, that we really understand the righteousness of God as we see less sin in our lives. We'll never be sinless, but there can be less sin. And, you know, as we uh, come to know our mission and purpose in Christ, you know, that's what it's all about, is to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh -huh. to share the righteousness of Christ by walking out our lives in righteousness and and uh, pointing people to the author of our righteousness, Jesus. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we move along to the next section of scripture. Um, the, the Bonhoeffer's works actually calls this uh, kindred, um, which just seems a little sinister. I know uh, there was an old horror movie in the 80s and the 90s called Kindred. And it wasn't good. And so uh, remembering Kindred, I share the murder picture from The Shining here. Um, red rum. Anyway, um, the scriptures that refer to murder, um, that Jesus, Jesus' words uh, in Matthew 5, 21 and 26 say, you have heard that it was said that uh, to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So, and we move along to murder. Uh, but I say unto you, Christ is the giver of the law. He empowers its fulfillment. After his previous words, it is obvious that Jesus is not to be understood here as a revolutionary, nor should we assume any exchange of opinion versus opinion in the manner of the rabbis. Instead, Jesus expresses, continuing what he said thus far, his unity with the law of the Mosaic Covenant, the law of Moses. But precisely in his true unity with the law of God, he makes clear that he, the Son of God is the Lord and giver of the law. Thus that, but I say to you, you know, but I say unto you, um, you know, Christ is, is agreeing with the law and pushing it to be even more uh, righteous um, in our understanding. It's, it's more than just the letter of the law. It's the heart and the intention behind the law that he's trying to reveal to the people, the true, you know, and the, he's trying to reveal the people who made the law God, uh, the true God of the law um, by showing its heart, you know. Bonhoeffer continues, only those who perceive the law to be the word of Christ can fulfill it. He rejected the sinful misunderstanding in which the Pharisees were called. True knowledge of the law lies solely and knowing Christ to be the Lord and fulfiller of the law. That's I love that. True knowledge of the law lies solely in knowing Christ to be the Lord and fulfiller of the law. Christ has laid his hand on the law and claimed it. 
In doing so, he did what the law truly intended. But in this unity with the law, he considered it considered an enemy by the false understanding of the law. Uh, you know, by by honoring the law, he gives himself up to the false elements of the law. Um, he's showing them, you know, by but by, by making the claims, by teaching them the true law. Uh, of of looking at the Mosaic Covenant and going in, in, even more, you know, what I say unto you, uh, there's even a deeper righteousness behind this law. By teaching that truth, he's called a, he's called a blasphemer. He's considered an enemy uh, by those who have a false understanding of the law. By honoring the law, he gives himself up to the false zealots of the law. That's that's crazy. Anyway. <laughs> Murder includes anger? What? Um, <laughs> the commandment to which Jesus first refers his disciples forbid murder, it forbids murder and entrusts the disciples with the well-being of their brothers or sisters. The life of one's brothers and sisters were granted by God and is in God's hand. Only God has the power over life and death. There is no place in the faith community of God for a murderer. Murderers are liable to the judgment they themselves exercise. The protection of God's command extends not only to the brothers and sisters who belong to the church community, but beyond. Uh, this is clearly shown by the fact that the actions of a follower of Jesus do not depend on other people's identity, but only to him whom the disciple follows in obedience. <laughs> Uh, Jesus' followers are forbidden to commit, commit murder under penalty of divine judgment. The life of a brother or sister is a boundary for Jesus' followers which may not be crossed. But anger already crosses that boundary. It is crossed even more by words bursting out of us in haste, raka, or insults. Uh, and it is crossed finally when we intentionally deride someone, someone else, you fool. Um, you know, anger equals murder, uh, according to these verses. Um, it's the spirit. You know, God wants to protect the life he the life he created. And so, when you take a life, you know, the Old Testament said a life for a life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, you know, weren't uh, you weren't supposed to be playing God by taking someone's life and uh, by insulting people. Um, we're we're deriding them and. Bonhoeffer goes on. What anger means to God? Anger is only one letter short of danger. Um, who, who knew? It doesn't even rhyme. Danger, anger. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, every angry at anger attacks. Every anger attacks the life of the other person. It, it, it begrudges others their lives. It craves the other's destruction. There is no distinction between so-called just anger and unjust anger. The disciples should not even know what anger is because anger is an assault on God and the other person. The angry words bursting out of us, which we take so lightly, uh, reveal that we do not respect the other person, that we view ourselves to be superior, and that we thus value our own lives more than the others. Um, such words are an injury to a sister or a brother, a, th a thrust to the heart. They are intended to strike, wound, and destroy. But intentional words of derision rob sisters and brothers of their dignity in public. They intend to make other people despise them as well. They aim in hatred to destroy another's internal and external existence. I pass judgment on another. That is murder. A murderer is handed over to judgment. So, yeah. You know, we're... The, the big thing here is, you know, that's that's that self-righteousness that comes out in anger. Um, people don't meet our expectations, and so we think they're not worthy. And we think we're superior to them. And, or they're, they're wicked while we're righteous. God sees us all as, as his creations, and that... Uh, our lives are precious. We're all made in the image of God. Um, so we're not to pass judgment on another. You know, that is murder, as, as, as Bonhoeffer points out. Um, <clears throat> and murderers have no place with God, as we pointed out. Um, anyone who is angry towards a sister or brother who aims harsh words at them 
who scorns or slanders another in public has, as a murderer, no place before God. Alienating oneself from another person causes alienation from God. Such alienated persons no longer have access to God. Their offerings or worship, their prayers cannot please God. Um, for the followers of Jesus, unlike the rabbis, uh, service to God in worship can never be separated from service to sisters and brothers. Contempt for others makes worship dishonest and deprives it of any divine fondness. You know, uh, individuals as well as church communities who intend to enter God's presence with contemptuous or unreconciled hearts are playing games with an idol. You know, we're playing Holy Joe, you know? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm going to pray. And then you're like looking out the side, you know, peeking uh, between, between closed eyes. You know, it's not true worship. Uh, we can't go before God. God knows our hearts. And if we have something, if someone has something against us, we're, we're commanded to make it right. As long as we withhold service and love from a sister or a brother, as long as he or she remains a target of our contempt, as long as a sister or brother has something against me or Jesus' community, our offerings will remain unaccepted. Uh, it is not just my own anger which gets between me and God, but even the fact that a brother or sister exists whom I have abused, humiliated, and dishonored, and who has something against me. Um, you know, that's sin to uh, what we've done, our hatred, our abuse, our offense towards other needs to be repented of, needs to be, uh, you know, we have to ask forgiveness of God and we have to ask forgiveness of the other person. Um, only then when we come forward with a repent in the heart uh, that is sought forgiveness, could, could we have true worship of the Lord? Um, Jesus is the son of God. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Um, Jesus pointed to, you know, these are, you know, from Exodus 20, from the 10 commandments. And Jesus reiterated it time and time again. He stood with the law and uh, murders right there. Um, and so we don't murder people's character. Um, disciples, examine yourselves. Absolutely. Exam um, for 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. And oh, brother, how can I, you know, how can I go on um, about that? Um, the term Christian is one of the most subjective terms uh, out there in terms of levels of maturity or levels of understanding. Uh, League of the Air Ministries has recently done a survey of what, what quote-unquote, uh, professing evangelicals believe. And, you know, just some of the results, uh, you know, uh, a good deal of the results are shocking. Um, over less than half of evangelicals uh, believe that Jesus is, is, is God. Um, they believe he's a good teacher, but don't believe he's God. More than more than 50% uh, of the quote-unquote evangelical surveyed said they believed that he was just a good teacher, not not God. So, and those people are calling themselves Christians. Uh, they also believe, you know, basically God accepts the worship of everyone. Um, tonight's lesson teaches that even if you're angry, he doesn't accept your your worship, even if you're a Christian. So if you're not worshiping, you know, through Jesus Christ, the mediator, um, you know, you're not accepted. Um, it's uh, Christ said he's the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me in John 14, 6. You know, and people believe there's more than one way to the Lord. This is um, not just people, people proclaiming to be Christians. So disciples, Examine yourself to see <laughs> whether you are in the faith. Uh, that's my my rant. So let's go with uh, what Bonhoeffer has to say. So the community of Jesus' disciples ought to examine itself as to whether it is at fault towards sisters and brothers and whether for the sake of the world it has participated in hating, despising, and humiliating others. To do these things is to be guilty of their murder. Jesus' community today ought to be examined whether at the moment it enters God's presence for prayer and worship, many accusing voices rise up between it and God and hinder its prayers. 
Jesus's community ought to examine whether it has given a sign of Jesus's love, which per preserves, supports, and protects lives to those whom the world has despised and dishonored. You know, to protect life, um, one issue comes up, you know, in today's age. It's the, the life of the unborn. Um, they are made in God's image as well. And, um, you know, we're not, <laughs> there are quote-unquote pro-choice Christians. Um who called murder uh, re reproductive rights. Yikes. So, yeah, Jesus' community ought to examine whether it has given a sign of Jesus' love, which preserves, pre supports, and protects lives to those whom the world has despised and dishonored. The unborn are despised and dishonored. Yikes. Um, you know, otherwise, we'll, we'll continue with the um, Bonhoeffer's commentary, not my comments. Otherwise, the most correct form of worship, the most pious prayer, the bravest confession will not help, but will give witness against it because it has ceased following Jesus. We are not allowed to separate God from our sister and brother. God does not want to be honored if a sister or brother is dishonored. God is the Father, yes. God is the Father of Jesus Christ who came to be a brother to us all. That is the ultimate reason why God refuses to be separated from our sister or brother. God's own son was dishonored and humiliated in order to honor the Father. But the Father, refusing to be separated from his son, will likewise not be separated from those whose humanity the son assumed as an equal and those whose for whose sake the Son bore his humiliation. Christ died for everybody. Um, because the Son of God became a human being, service to God in worship can no longer be detached from service to sisters and brothers. Those who say that they love God and yet hate their brothers or sisters are liars. Love God, love people. Anyway, uh, the path of reconciliation. Thus, there remains only one path for those who, in following Jesus, want to truly serve God in worship, and that is the path of reconciliation with their sisters and brothers. Anyone who comes to the word and sacrament with an unreconciled heart stands judged by doing so. Such a person is a murderer in God's sight. That is why you must first be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. It is a difficult path Jesus imposes on his disciples. It includes much humiliation and dishonor for the disciples themselves, but it is the path to him, our crucified brother, and thus it is a path full of grace. And Jesus, service to the least brother or sister and service to God become one. He went and was re reconciled to his brother, his human kindred, and then he came and offered himself the one true sacrifice to his father. This is still a time of grace for brothers and sisters are still given to us and we are still on the way with them. The day of judgment lies be before us. There is still time to offer satisfaction to, to a sister or brother. There is still time to pay what we owe to those whom we are indebted. Uh, the hour is coming in which we shall be handed over to the judge then it will be too late. Then righteousness and punishment shall rule until the last debt is paid. And, you know, I shared the, the photo here of the path of reconciliation. Um, it's uh, from Dr. Neil Anderson of Freedom in Christ Ministries. And it uh, it's, it's a book that helps people, you know, it connects people to God and to each other, as the subtitle tells us. Um, so, if you need to be reconciled with somebody, you know, at least offer your apologies and, and ask for forgiveness. You can't control what the other person does, but you can, you, by, by asking for forgiveness from them, you will be, you know, you will be forgiven by the Lord. Um, you will be right with God for doing the right thing, even if they despise you and don't want anything to do with you. Um, you have to ask. You know, um, it's called amends. Anyway, uh, let's move along. Uh, satisfying others, that's the path of the cross. What? 
Um, can we understand that our sisters and brothers are not given to Jesus to, uh, to Jesus disciples as an expression of the law, but of grace? You know, it is grace to be permitted to satisfy our sisters and brothers and to help them attain their rights. It is a grace that we may be reconciled with our sisters and brothers. There, they are our grace before the day of judgment. You know? The only one who can speak to us like that is the one who himself, as our brother, Jesus, became our grace, our reconciliation, our salvation from judgment. The grace of sisters and brothers is granted to us in the humanity of the Son of God. Might the disciples of Jesus seriously contemplate that? You know, service to sisters and brothers which satisfies them and respects their rights in life is the path of self-denial, the path to the cross. No one has greater love than those who lay down their lives for their friends. That is the love of the crucified one. Thus, his, this commandment is fully fulfilled <laughs> solely in the cross of Jesus. So, yeah, it is a grace to be able to help other people and to be forgiven by them. You know, um, if you've ever been on the outs with someone and repented and, and been brought back into their trust and their fellowship, um, that's peace. That is grace. Uh, at work god's divine favor working in that process of you trying to be made right with your fellow men to honor god not to honor our people but we should you know they are made in the image of god and we are to serve them it's the, the path of the to the cross and then we move along or bonhoeffer moves along to um uh, the chapter known as woman uh, i subtitle is lust in the heart um, from Matthew 5, 27 and 32, uh, Jesus' words say, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for the whole body to be cast into hell. Uh, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. And we move along. Our bond to Jesus Christ permits no desire without love. You know, so that's an easy way to say that um, really he permits no sex without the loving marriage covenant. And, um, I shared a little meme that says, what would, what would you say if I said no sex till marriage the man replies uh, or the woman uh when's the best date for the wedding you know, so so yeah uh god doesn't frown upon sex he made it for uh pleasure and love it's the expression of love and for the procreation of children um god has no problem with sex uh, it's it's that lust that desire that's the problem uh, he, puts, he permits, so Jesus Christ permits no desire without love. Instead, such desire is forbidden the disciple. Because discipleship is self-denial and a complete bond with Jesus, at, at no point may the disciple's own desire, uh, desire driven, will, will take over. Such lust, and even if it were only in a single look, disconnects us from discipleship and brings the whole body into hell. It causes human beings to sell their heavenly birthright for a bowl of pot porridge. Pottage, if, uh, that's what the original version says. They do not believe him uh, uh, who can grant a joy a hundredfold to make up for a desire denied. Yeah, that's the rejection of, of Christ. Um, they do not trust what is invisible, but sees only the visible fruit of desire. 
you know, instead of the spiritual, we grab the physical. They fall away from the path of discipleship and can become separated from Jesus. Our sin does break the harmony with us and, and, and the Lord. You know, lack of faith is what lust, what makes lust impure. You know, we, we lose our faith, so we give into uh, sexual sin. What is the only reason is to, that is the only reason is to be condemned. And it's the lack of faith, the total disobedience to the word of God. No sac. Uh, I'll continue. Uh, no sacrifice that the disciple uh, disciples make to be free of that desire, which separates them from Jesus, is too great. Thus, the eye is less than Christ, and the hand is less than Christ. If the eye and the hand serve lust and hinder the whole body from the purity of discipleship, then they, rather than Jesus Christ, should be sacrificed. The benefits of desire are small compared to the harm it does. You gain the desire of your eye or your hand for a moment, and you lose your whole body for eternity. Your eye, when it is serving uh, impure desire, cannot see God. Our lust blinds us. Um, what? No sex? Did Jesus mean that this literally? And did he mean we should really cut out our eyes and cut off our hands? Um, let's see. Uh, Bonhoeffer says, at this point, uh, must we not decisively face the question of whether Jesus intended his commands to be taken literally or merely, merely figuratively? Must not our whole life depend on a clear answer to this question? Must not the disciples' attitude already determine the answer? Our own will advises us to flee from this decision, which uh, appears to be uh, so deadly serious. But the question itself is wrong and evil. It cannot be answered. If we were to say that, of course, the command is not meant to be taken literally, then we should uh, we would already be, have dodged the seriousness of the command. But if we were to say, of course, it would it, it should be taken literally, this would only show the Christian existence is absurd on principle, and the command would lose its authority. You know, if everyone was walking around cutting their eyes out and their hands off, people would have a real problem with our faith. Um, you know, it is precisely that fact for us. This basic question is not answered, and that binds us completely to Jesus' command. Neither option offers us an escape. We are trapped and must obey. That's the thing. Jesus does not force his disciples into an inhuman constraint. He does not forbid them to look. But he guides the disciple to look to himself, you know, knowing that here the disciples' view will remain pure. Um, even when they look at a woman, you know, in this way, he does not impose on his disciples an unbearable yoke of the law, but mercifully helps them by way of the gospel. You know, abide in me, and I in you, you know, without me, you can do nothing. So keep your eye on Christ, and uh, you, you won't consider sin as, as uh, desire, you know, as, as, uh, worthy of your desire as you think um that, this brings up the question must we marry um you know <laughs> jesus does not demand that his followers get married but he sanctifies marriage according to the law by declaring it to be unbreakable even in cases where one party divorces the other because of infidelity he prohibits the other from remarrying I'm going to let that one go because, wow, uh, there's I think there's many different teachings on that. Um, and quite frankly, uh, it's it's rough, um, you know. But it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of how you want to obey the Lord. Um, when we marry, it is supposed to be for life. Jesus does make a, in the text, Jesus says, you know, basically, unless you uh, towards other than sexual morality. So it indicates that um, you know, the marriage can be broken by infidelity uh, of a sexual nature. Um, but there's a question of abuse and uh, all that. So I would uh, advise people to go to the scriptures and, and uh, go, go to the Lord and, uh, and to try to obey um, and try to keep your marriage intact instead of divorce. Uh, I am divorced, so this is hard. In fact, my first marriage was to a divorced woman, so I'm double. I'm double trouble. Um, so if if she was supposed to stay married to her husband, 
I committed adultery by by marrying uh, a, a divorced woman, and then unfortunately, uh, surprise that that marriage didn't work out um, because I decided I wanted to follow Christ, and my ex didn't want to be with me any longer after that. Um, after years being together. Um, so it's 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 hard and let's just say i had biblical biblical reasons for getting divorced um i was con i was committed to my marriage but when that came up uh and um there was no reconciliation um you know basically we divorced and um and then i went on and found my new wife tammy lynn and um uh, so and she was divorced too, um, so so that so that's this is a tough part of scripture for me. If if uh, Bonhoeffer is making the case that every marriage, um, uh, you know, he pro prohibits the other, even in even in cases where one party divorces the other because of infidelity, he prohibits the other from remarrying. Yikes! Uh, with this commandment, Jesus liberates marriage from selfish, evil desire and intends it to be conducted as a service of love as is possible only in following him. Now, that's the thing. You know, our marriage was supposed to be God-centered, man and wife with God at the middle. Um, Jesus does not disapprove of the body and its natural desires. He doesn't He doesn't condone and condemn sex, but he rejects the last lack of faith that is concealed in it. You know, so we're supposed to stay in that covenant. Um, and if we... We don't. We're we're showing our lack of faith through our disobedience. You know. Thus, he does not dissolve marriage, but strengthens and sanctifies it by faith. Those who follow him maintain their soul allegiance to Christ, even in their marriage, by practicing discipline and self denial. Only within the context of your marriage do you have sex. Um, Christ is Lord, even of the follower's marriage. You know. This causes the marriage of disciples to be something different than civil marriage. But again, this is not contempt for marriage, but precisely its sanctification. He wants to keep it holy between a man and a woman is where the desire is 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 approved and you know condoned and holy as in the marriage covenant. Uh, he doesn't want people divorcing left and right. And unfortunately, in our society, that happens a lot. Uh, ask me how I know. I already told you. Um, anyway, complete purity. Um, uh, my podcast named Purity. I can tell you that you are, my daily encouragements is called Purity, and it's for a reason. It started, um, you know, basically from my attempts to be sexually pure, and I can say I, for se for seasons of my life, I was, and then I found my wife, um, my Christian wife, and we have God at the center of our marriage. Anyway, uh, <laughs> This isn't about me. It's about Bonhoeffer. Let's go. Um, complete purity. It appears that Jesus contradicts the Old Testament law by demanding that marriages be indissolvable. But he explains his conformity with Mosaic law. Uh, because of the hardness of their hearts, the Israelites were, were, were permitted divorce. That means it was permitted only to keep their hearts from even greater wantonness. But the intent of the Old Testament law agrees with Jesus in that its main concern is the purity of marriage, marriage conducted in faith in God. This purity, that is chastity, is preserved in community with Jesus in discipleship. Because Jesus is solely concerned with the complete purity, that is, the chastity of his disciples, he must also praise complete renunciation of marriage for the sake of God's realm. So it's okay if you want to stay single, just you will be pure. Um, Jesus does not make either marriage or celibacy into a required program, um, but those are basically your two options. Instead, he frees his disciples uh, infidelity within and outside uh, from infidelity within and outside of marriage, which is a sin not only against one's own body, but a sin against the very body of Christ, as it said uh, says in First Corinthians six thirteen through fifteen. You know, do you not know you sin against your own body and you join yourself to a harlot? Yikes! Um, so yeah, uh, sin. And and we and we complete um, Bonhoeffer's commentary with a sin against your body and Christ's body. 
even the body of the disciple belongs to Christ and discipleship. Our bodies are members of his body because Jesus, the Son of God, assumed a human body. And because we are in communion with his body, that is why infidelity is a sin against Jesus' own body. You know, we're joined to Christ. Jesus' body was crucified. We were crucified with him. The apostle says of those who belong to Christ that they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You don't hear that one much, but that's what, you know, I, that's why I share the verse here. Um, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That comes right after the fruit of the spirit. So it's like, yeah, walk in the spirit, do this. And by the way, those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh. We turn from our sin. We don't just glory in it and, you know, um, take the grace of the Lord continually and just sin all the more. Um, thus, the fulfillment of even this Old Testament commandment becomes true only in the crucified, murdered body of Jesus Christ. The sight of that body, which was given for us, and our communion with it, provide the disciples with the strength for chastity, which Jesus commands. Yeah, when, when we realize, you know, the, the sight of his body on the cross, right? Uh, when we when we consider that Christ died for us, you know, it should do something to our conscience. That, you know, he died to save us. Our debts have been paid because of his sacrifice. His suffering was for us. Um, he did it for the love of us. And he saved us and brought us into, our king, into his kingdom, giving us new life and new power in Christ. And will you just continue, continue in your sin, sins? Um, no, that body you know, should cause us to change what we do with our body in terms of sexual purity. And um, as I said, that's the end of the three chapters uh, that we covered tonight um, from Diedrich Bonhoeffer's Discipleship or the Cost of Discipleship. Um, I'm M.T. Clark. Um, I hope you enjoyed what you, what we uh, talked about tonight. Um, and these are some tough tough scriptures um you know that, that tell us if we hate someone it, it matters what we think um about people and if we say things or insult people you know in our culture people insult each other as forms of humor and everything else um but it shows sarcasm and, and insults and um you know rough words and judgments as is anger and it is associated with murder and our lust our culture of lust in in the 21st century is unparalleled as we have uh, hookup apps and there's pornography all over the internets and on people's phones and everywhere and um you know it's 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 a sign of the times of how how things have gotten you know, I thought things were liberated when I was growing up and uh, things it makes me blush, um, you know, basically that um, we're so far from what God's law would have us do. And uh, instead of being convicted of our sin, we, we continue in unrighteousness. And uh, but christ and uh christ christ died for us to forgive us of our sins we can be forgiven but the power of our faith comes from following christ and that is to follow his example of sexual purity and love um you know not hating your brother and so and and that's why i do these studies is, is basically to encourage a life of discipleship to encourage people that this type of life um where we submit to the lord and 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 fulfill uh his righteousness by being communion in with him and you know having a heart relationship with the lord to want to do the father's will want to walk in the lord's path that it's possible to overcome so many sins of the flesh and uh i'm here to encourage people to uh keep walking and talking with god and read the word of god let it renew your mind and do it for the joy set before you and instead of uh, a drudgery our life uh in the presence of the lord is, should be one of peace love joy uh, patience faithfulness gentleness and goodness 
kindness and self-control. And when we walk in the spirit instead of the flesh, those, 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 those things will manifest in our lives. Um, that's it for this tonight's teaching on lesson seven of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's discipleship. And um, as always, we encourage people to check out mtforchrist.org where you can find uh, Christian encouragements and uh, links to the, the podcast and the YouTube channel um, to check everything out. And uh, we also recommend our our other program that we do with uh, Arthur and Susanna Sincati, our informal Bible study called Bible Study with the Sincatis that we, that we upload every Sunday. Um, as Arthur develops the study, and we and we talk about our lives in faith to show people that um, you know this is this is how Christians live. We we think about the things of God, um, we talk about it, and we try to live it. And so, from me uh, to all of you, I wish you all well. So let's uh, pray it out. Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for another day in Your Kingdom, Lord. We thank you for uh, faithful men and women of God like. Uh, well, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, that encouraged us uh, by going to the scriptures and um, you know extracting um, what Christ was saying and encouraging us into a life of discipleship. Lord, we're we're never going to be perfect, but uh, we're never going to be sinless. But we can sin less, and uh, we can know the righteousness of of God when we are in communion with the righteous one who's fulfilled the law completely. Um, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and uh, we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. As I said more than once, that's the end of tonight's speeching. Uh, I wish you all well, and God bless you all.